Cyberpunk's original creator has opened up with a no BS approach. GOG have pulled out a large win and, of course, more news on the epic Shenmue situation. All that and more in today's episode of The Roundup. Hey everyone and welcome to the first of this week's roundups, our Tuesday and Friday show that gets you up to speed with all the most important stories in gaming. First, the Shenmue situation. So, in case you're not aware, Shenmue 3 was a crowdfunded continuation of a much-loved series from the Dreamcast era. It did super well in Kickstarter and seems to have had a relatively smooth production over the last few years, with the developers, Yu Suzuki's YSNet, being fairly good with their Kickstarter updates. They recently got Deep Silver on board as a publisher, which is potentially what will have led to their most recent public troubles. So, Deep Silver is owned by Koch Media and they are owned recently by THQ Nordic, and they've been quite okay with epic exclusivity deals in the past, such as with Metro Exodus. Though, to Deep Silver's credit as a publisher, they directed people's anger and outrage to them and away from 4A Games, the developers of Metro, and that was definitely the right thing to do as they were not the ones who made that decision. Well, moving on to Shenmue 3, it seems like it's more of a joint deal, at least based on how the communications are, where it's both YSNet and Deep Silver. Now, the news that Shenmue 3 would be an epic exclusive on PC, that did not go down well. I mean, sure, the game had been kickstarted for Windows and not for Steam, and Steam was clarified later after the Kickstarter, but it's still fair to say that consumers expected Steam for a PC game and Kickstarter. This was, of course, just another entry to the fairly long line of crowdfunded games that have went to Epic, but perhaps it stung a bit more given how the last entry to this series was in 2001. People really do want this. Well, we've received another update a rather strange one from them in Kickstarter, and this is how it reads. We want to make sure that the backers are aware we are listening to their concerns. We kindly ask our fans to have some patience. We are currently at E3 demoing our game and need to get back to our respective offices to assess the situation and together find a way forward to justify the trust you've placed in us. And I've got to be real, that was a pretty odd statement to see. It was clearly knowing of the whole epic situation, and it's just quite strange. They didn't say anything other than they are listening and are going to be assessing the situation. Now, I'm actually quite surprised that they haven't doubled down or just said, listen, the deal is signed, that's the funding we got, we can't go back. Saying that they're going back to their offices to work out a solution together, well, that is an interesting development. So will they get out of being an Epic exclusive? It's quite hard to say. Epic will have provided them with some funding. If the SNK example from a few days ago, if that's anything to go by, well, this would have been in the form of advanced sales revenue. So them just getting, you know, 100,000 copies worth of revenue up front. Now, given how the cost of Shenmue 3 is uh, quite high and how they have needed external funding past the Kickstarter and how they have been open about that, it's pretty hard to see how they could just give that money back and still get across the line unless they're able to come with some sort of or come to a rather non-standard solution with Epic. At any rate though, E3 is over, they will be back in their offices soon and there will no doubt be more to hear. And then to cap things off with the Shenmue 3 stories, we actually found out that it's going to take Ryu to 40% through his story, so I suppose we'll uh, be up to Shenmue 8 or 9 by the time the series is done with. All right, let's move on to Cyberpunk. So, Mike Pondsmith, the man who designed the original Cyberpunk 2020 RPG has opened up on a few topics. He reassured people that he is actively involved in the creation of Cyberpunk 2077, and he then went on to explain elements of the game as well as to hit back on critics. So, in the game, the animals are a gang of tech-augmented bodybuilders, with their leader being a woman called Sasquatch. A few game website bloggers took issue with this, thinking that the game was calling people with their particular immutable characteristics animals, and uh, you know the bloggers were just talking about how they felt uncomfortable and how it was perhaps problematic. Well, Pondsmith had very simple words for them, saying, The whole freaking point is that they think of themselves as powerful, dangerous, wild animals. You'd have thought the lady named Sasquatch would have given them a clue. As Pondsmith rightly points out, a touch of common sense goes a long way. I suppose you don't really get that for default when you're a columnist. He continued to talk about the Voodoo Boys, a gang who were similarly criticized. He said that they originally were a scathing commentary 
on cultural appropriation. And he went on to say that he loves how in 2077, of course, far after 2020, the original pen and paper, uh, actual practitioners have taken over. CDPR have talked about working with a Haitian NGO and voodoo practitioners to help them get the culture right. And uh, I've seen many praising the depiction, including actual Haitian people talking about the dialects and the language being right. Now, of course, no individual on Reddit can speak for an entire group, nor should they be expected to, but it does seem like the surface level critiques by salty bloggers don't hold that much weight. But I suppose you do need a big zingy article. As for said critics, well, he didn't hold back and this is what he said. Who the demonetization do you think you are to tell me whether or not my creation was done right or not? That's what he said, and well damn said. Creativity is seemingly under attack from many angles these days. People are willing to go in hard without full context before things are even made. Context is just thrown out the window the second it gets in the way of a spicy hot take. This is a game that, when you look at it, it's trying harder than just about any others to portray a diverse melting pot with Night City. Seemingly, every group is represented there. You know, there's probably never been such freedom in character creation. You can be whoever you want. There is so much freedom and choice past what is common, and yet... In spite of having all of that in spades and seemingly being done quite well, cyberpunk is being attacked with more vigor than most, it would seem. And this is especially sad given how well integrated all of that diversity is with the genre, likely the themes, and also the lore of the game. This seems to have been done really quite right. It's a very natural setting for all of these things to be the way that they are. The team really appear to be doing their damnness to realize a world with all of that depth and breadth. And it's aggravating to see how some segments of the internet are reacting to it. As I said in the video that I did about Cyberpunk a few days ago, you know, there are people who are so interested in their political goals or just their goals in general that they'll only skim the surface level aesthetics of a piece of media. They'll miss out on the subtext. Indeed, they'll throw the subtext out the window if it'll help their argument. Something that we saw with that in-game advertising situation. I'll almost always be championing creative freedom in, you know, in all directions and it's very heartening to see Pondsmith's no BS attitude. It really is. I'm glad to see that this stuff's clearly not getting him down. Still, on Cyberpunk, we do have the topic of crunch. So the CD Projekt Red studio heads have been talking about non-obligatory crunch and how they are reaffirming their prior commitments to provide a healthy working environment for their employees. This all came through an interesting interview with Kotaku's Jason Schreier, of course, a man who's very well connected with that studio and almost certainly does have a few, you know, rumbly stories in the back pocket for if Cyberpunk turns out to be a horror story. They said that nobody will be expected to work past regular hours. Schreier said that that was fine, but... What about social pressures that will make people feel not comfortable going home? I say going home early, I mean going home at 5 p.m. Well, they responded by saying that they can't be 200% sure that there are zero social pressures, but that they want to ingrain that it is okay to go home on time or go home early in the company culture. They went on to say this. They can't be 200% sure that there are zero social pressures, but that they want to ingrain that it's okay to go home in the company culture. And he basically went on to say, and it's not worth just, you know, regurgitating what he said exactly because it was conversational, so it doesn't really read that well if I just repeat it to you, but he said that... Going home, that is okay in the company culture. If you want to stay longer hours if it's needed, that's also okay in the company culture. He talked about how it's all about just having an open conversation and people not feeling guilty. And that's what they mean when they say non-obligatory crunch. Uh, he said that as good as it works in practice, what matters, though, is their actual implementation. He talked about how their words, you know, they won't mean much if it doesn't actually happen. And that on the HR side and with team leaders and producers, Basically, they're putting a lot of focus on, you know, it being ingrained with those people. And really much of this seems to just be a loud public commitment that gives their employees ammunition. A clear sort of thing where, you know, the studio heads have said the crun that crunch is not mandatory. So if a employee feels pressured, they can turn around to their manager and just give them a firm no. So it is good that they've said that publicly and made that commitment. But it is an interesting situation because here's the deal. What they've said is actually fairly realistic, right? Saying that zero crunch will be done, that probably would be a lie. 
saying that people can do overtime if they want, but they are not forced to, that is more in, uh, just, that's more in line with reality, right? A little bit of what you could maybe call crunch will happen, but as they said, it's all down to the execution. It's all down to how deep this stuff goes in the company culture. Here's the thing, there's always going to be more that can be done. Polish, bug fixes, cleaning up assets, fiddling around with the light to make a scene a bit more pleasing. A lot of artists will want to spend a little bit more time in that. Much of avoiding crunch is knowing when to push back dates or when to cut things that would be nice to have. And even if you have cut things that would be nice to have, well, the things that you're left with, they could almost always do with a bit more polish. It takes a hell of a lot of discipline to have no crunch happen, to actually just say no and let something that's not perfect be not perfect. Here's the thing. If someone wants to put in an extra 10 hours a week and get some overtime pay, maybe they want that pay, I think they should be free enough to do so, right? Everyone's different, everyone has a different situation, and that's fine. But if people feel forced, that's a problem. If people are doing crazy stuff, like 70 hour weeks, that's a problem. You know, hanging back an extra hour, that's okay if you want to get an asset finished while it's fresh in your head. But three months of everyone working 12 hours? Hell no. Contractors getting, you know, only getting renewed if they half kill themselves working obscene hours. That's also a big hell no. It's very hard to manage that. I do think that as a matter of policy, after so many hours, people should just be told, listen, you've got to go home. If someone's taking it too far, well, their work is less efficient, right? So you're not getting good uh, value out of the money you're spending in them. And then they'll inadvertently be exerting social pressures on their colleagues, which will further diminish the productivity and therefore economic efficiency of those employees, which is not good for a business. So I suppose while I will commend CD Projekt Red for having a seemingly pretty open and honest discussion uh, of this topic, their plan does seem rather open to failure through social pressures, regardless of what they're saying here. Of course, I do wish them all well for the sake of their staff, and it is worth referring back to what we said about Nintendo in the last episode, that instead of crunch, they have a network of reliable contractors and that they're more than happy to delay titles for the sake of their staff. Next though, we've got a fantastic bit of news for GOG. Microsoft are going to support Galaxy 2.0, the new version of their launcher that somewhat aims to be the one launcher that rules them all, unifying all of your platforms in one place. Now, most of the time, that sort of, you know, mono launcher, like one launcher for everything, that kind of just means it being one library, but when you actually want to launch a game, it opens through Epic or through Steam anyway. A Steam game can only launch directly through Galaxy if Valve and GOG work together with an integration, which does seem fairly unlikely, but Microsoft have said that they will integrate with Galaxy 2, and that will give GOG users a great experience on that launcher with their Microsoft games. And that's something that's even more relevant given Game Pass. So hopefully more publishers get on board. I'm fairly sure I can get my hands on a Galaxy beta when it launches, so I will walk you through that. And I'll say that it's really refreshing to see Microsoft's approach, that they know people want to use this launcher, they know they want to sell copies of Game Pass, so why not let people have their Game Pass games on the launcher they want to use? In a time where we're seeing more exclusives, that is very refreshing indeed. Next, and still on the topic of Microsoft, we've got something a bit wild. As you may already know, Telltale games are disappearing off the internet, seemingly because they were licensed such that once the game licenses went from the stores, the stores would lose their access to the games, meaning that the users, even those who've, uh, who've already purchased the games, cannot download them because they literally won't be on the download servers. This seems to have been what's happened on most stores, oddly enough, bar GOG, who seemingly would not budge on purchasers always having download access when it came to their licensing uh, deals. Now, what's interesting is that something has happened with Minecraft Story Mode, but only on the Xbox 360, because over there, each episode costs $100. What gives? Well, they wanted to give users the ability to download their games before they went away for good. They seemingly could not do this without having them be listed on the store. Uh, now, they had to list them, right? But in order to deter people from purchasing, they listed them at $100, complete with a blog post explaining that it went down like that, uh, just why it went down, the technical reasons, and telling people not to purchase because they will be charged. And that is just so strange. There's not really much to break down with that because we've already really covered the story last week, but it's just a really funny instance of it. I know there could be conspiracy theories that they're trying to sell Minecraft story mode for a grand, but I don't, I mean, I don't really see that. I mean, I'm open to it being a bit shady and weird, sure, but I, I need to see more proof, right, before I can jump into that. Right now, I do think that it probably just is some 
weird intricacy of the Xbox 360 store and that's why it is the way that it is and that they're not just trying to profiteer. And then finally, we've got two studio stories. So with Microsoft, they've opened a new Age of Empires studio. It uh, certainly is going to be good news for RTS fans like myself, but I expect it to be quite some time before we hear something super concrete about them. They have been a bit silent about AoE 4. And then finally, we do have an odd story from Amazon who have cut dozens of roles within Amazon Game Studios. It seems like they are refocusing on two new worlds world and some unannounced projects, but they clearly are cutting down the scope of something that was going on there. It's fairly hard to tell what happened exactly, but it is further proof that sometimes jobs are not cut because a company isn't profitable, they're cut because the specific job roles aren't profitable and that they're not needed. Uh, Amazon have said, though, that the employees will get support in relocating within the organization and they will also get full severance if they choose to leave the organization. Still, Amazon's gaming strategy remains rather unclear. It'll take some time before we really get a solid idea what Amazon are planning. Seemingly, many of their projects are quite some time off, so I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. But there we go, that is it for today's episode of the Roundup. A lot of super interesting topics, follow-ups to existing stories. Certainly, it's interesting to see the post-E3 cyberpunk fallout and definitely heartening to see Mike Pondsmith uh, respond to a lot of the criticism that, as you know, I think is just a little bit ridiculous. So, thank you very much for watching this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell for many more videos in the future. And with that, I will see you next time.